everything's going to be sweet. And uh, so if you are just joining us, we're in the book of Ephesians. We've been studying through this book now for many months. And you are joining us in chapter 4, looking at verses 7 through 13. And so uh, let's go ahead and read together. I know you just sat down, but I'm going to ask you to stand up again for the reading of God's word. Ephesians 4, uh, verses 7 through 13. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean <clears throat> but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who as ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edification for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of, <clears throat> excuse me, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Father, we're so privileged to be here this morning. And Lord, I pray that if this is just another Sunday morning in church to any of us, Lord, that you would break that down and change our hearts and that we would recognize what a, a, a gift this is to be able to gather together and to have fellowship in your spirit, to read your word without fear, or to enjoy the, your presence and the ministry of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would meet each of us this morning, Lord, regardless of how short or far we have traveled with you thus far, we pray that you would meet us this morning and you would change us and you would empower us and equip us, God, to be your people in this world. And so, Lord, we, we come not as hearers only, but as doers of your word, trusting that your spirit will give us the ability to understand, the, the courage uh, to obey and the, the heart to, to act upon these things, Lord. We trust you for these things and pray you would bless our time together now. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, have a seat. <clears throat> so, uh, as we get into chapter 4, it, it's obviously coming on the heels of the first three chapters of the letter, which has been largely doctrinal. Uh, if you look there in verse 1, we have the Apostle Paul begging, pleading with you and I, ultimately, to walk worthy of our calling. Now, that calling is essentially the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians that Paul unpacks for us. And uh, basically, when Paul says to us, walk worthily, he, he's asking us to live out everything that God has worked in to our life through Christ Jesus. He's begging the church, pleading with us still today, so many years later, to walk worthily, to walk out, to live out the things that God has worked into us through Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and these things that he's talked about in the first three chapters are, are truths that are universal to every person who is a truly born-again believer. He talks about how we are blessed and how we are chosen, how we are holy, how we are predestined, adopted, adopted uh, redeemed, how we are heirs of God, and how we've been sealed in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he goes on to talk about how Jew and Gentile have been brought together in Christ Jesus and made one new man in him. And these are glorious spiritual realities that belong to every single person in this room if you have come to Christ Jesus by faith. It doesn't matter where you're from. 
doesn't matter what color your skin is, doesn't matter what education you have, how much money you got in the bank. These are our precious, glorious truths that are ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. And these things have been worked into our lives through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, the Holy Spirit being the gift of the Father given to us through the finished work of the Son. Amen? And so the Apostle Paul, when he says walk worthily of all that God has done for you, one of the main emphases that he makes is uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. And we've discussed that in previous studies at length. And one of the reasons that he says we have to work at it is because it comes so unnaturally to us. Yes, we all possess the same spiritual truths and realities, but apart from that, I mean, you look around this room alone and you've got a huge, you know, diverse group of people with incredibly polar, polarized backgrounds and histories and everything else. And everything else. And so the unity of the Spirit does not go unchallenged, right? The, the enemy, the Satan, the devil, he knows how powerful the church is when we are unified. And so he never ceases to uh, work at dividing us and splitting us up. We have a cunning adversary, and he will employ any means. He will exploit any opportunity to separate you and I from one another. He will take any crack he can find and try and turn it into a huge chasm or split. Uh, I have been doing a refresher course on church history recently. And I'll tell you what, you know, you want some interesting reading. If you can, you know, manage to get through all the names and dates, uh, it is a tragedy how uh, divided the church has been or become in some aspects. Perhaps there's, it's, perhaps it's inevitable, perhaps there's even a necessity to it. But still we see that our enemy is relentless in trying to divide the church. And so you and I have to endeavor as Christians to uh, keep, preserve, maintain, protect the unity of the spirit that belongs to us each by right of our relationship through Christ Jesus. We have to work at it. It has to be deliberate. It has to be intentional. It's not just going to happen by itself. And so that's the warning. That's what the Apostle Paul is calling us to do. Uh, and in order to accomplish that, what does he say? He says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love and in peace. There is no way we will maintain the unity of the Spirit without humility. If we allow our you know, fleshly pride and our uh, arrogance and our you know, pettiness and pushiness to get in the way, we'll never get there. Amen? And so Paul says we have so much to be united uh, by. We, uh, there, there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one faith, one baptism, one, sorry, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. This is the holy ground, if you will, upon which every believer has found fellowship and gathered throughout the ages and generations. And it is the ground upon which every future generation of Christians shall find unity in the Holy Spirit. David, the psalmist, I think it's David, I could be wrong, forgive me. Psalm 133, verse 1, many of us know this verse. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's God's heart. It's one of the reasons Jesus came. It's why he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that we can be one people, united in one spirit, serving one purpose. And so that just serves as a background for where we read this morning. We get to verse 7, and we read, uh, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So after this introduction, the Apostle Paul says, But, 
Okay, and the temptation is to think, okay, we're moving on to another subject now, but that's not the case. Paul is still very much talking about unity of the church. Uh, But he says, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Uh, What does that mean? Paul is shifting his focus here. While he's still talking about the importance of unity, the importance of us being all on the same page spiritually, he says to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so here we have a shift in focus. Paul is turning, if you will, from this idea of the collective unity of the body to the role of the individual within that body. Okay? So now you might say that the Holy Spirit's talking to each one of us as individuals. Amen? But still in the overall context of us as a body of believers. So far, the emphasis of uh, chapter 4 has been on, you know, these singular truths and experiences that we all share in common, as we already mentioned, one body, one spirit, one faith. But now the emphasis is on how our individual differences serve that ultimate purpose. How the whole body of Christ is comprised of a necessary and beautiful diversity among us each as individuals. And so while we share, all of us together, if we're born again, spirit-filled Christians, while on one hand we share uh, certain fundamental spiritual traits and and character, if you will, none of us are the same. We are each absolutely unique in what God has equipped us for and planned for us and, and our place within the body of Christ. And so Paul says through the Holy Spirit to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, Before we talk about specifically what that means, we just want to not rush past this word grace because I don't know everybody who's in this room. Amen? For most of us here, the word grace is one of the most precious words that we possess in our vocabulary. Amen? Grace. And I don't... Hopefully, you know, whether you're a young Christian or an old Christian seasoned saint... This word grace still is as important to you as it has ever been. Because the grace of God speaks of the unmerited, unearned favor of God upon our lives. And for those of us who have come into the experience of that grace, it has changed everything in our lives. The grace of God. Great acronym for the word grace. I Pick this up somewhere along the way, and every time I refer to grace, it always pops into my head. And a great acronym for the English word grace, anyway G R A C E, God's riches at Christ's expense. And that is the reality and the truth for every single one of us here. We possess the riches of God's love and kindness and plans and purposes. At the, rich, uh, at the expense of Christ Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Ephesians chapter 2, when we were studying just a few weeks ago, reads it this way, Ephesians 2, 4 through 8. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show what? The exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God and not of works, lest anyone should boast. Hallelujah. If that's not the best news you've ever heard in your life, then just, you need by faith to 
receive it this morning because you will find that it is very quickly. Again, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, I got the NIV version for this passage. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith, again, into this grace by which we now stand. So hopefully most of us in this room can say that we, we understand that our only hope of standing before a holy God is through His grace. And that grace has been uh, manifested to us through His Son, Christ Jesus, who died on the cross for, his, for our sins and has risen from the grave victorious and uh, e eternal. Uh, John 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but through me. No one comes to the Father but through me. We believe that there is one way through the life, through the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Savior. As we read just recently, there is one Lord and one faith. And it is by grace that we come into all of that. But here we have in this particular verse in Ephesians 4, verse 7, Paul is saying, uh, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So, so what is Paul talking about? In addition to the grace by which every believer stands before God, we have also been given a measure of grace by which we serve. Okay? I want to draw a distinction between those two. They may, they may not be a distinction in the Lord himself, but from where you and I stand, we might say that there's a distinction. There is the grace that you and I have all received collectively by which we stand in the body of Christ. But God, in addition to that grace, has given us a measure of grace by which we serve. And that is going to look different in each of our lives as we see here in a moment. This measure of grace that Paul refers to is in the form of spiritual gifts, tools, abilities given to each individual person for the purpose of serving the Lord. So again, there is a universal grace, amen, there is a universal grace that every believer receives that gives us our standing in the body of Christ and a specific individual measure of grace that each receives regarding our service through, uh, within the body. Forgive me. Uh, we have another verse to reinforce this idea. Romans chapter 12, verse 6 through 8. It says there, we, speaking of the body, have different gifts according to the grace given us. Amen? So, uh, every believer has been given a gift in the body of Christ. If you're here this morning and you are born again, follower of Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, you have been given a spiritual gift. And uh, we will not be getting into the details of those gifts this morning. We won't be looking at the differences between the ministries and the offices this morning. Uh, on that note, I was talking with Pastor Lauren earlier this morning, and you know he's been uh, letting everybody know that uh, he would like to start a new series, a, a new uh, teaching series in the near future. And I was thinking, well, maybe this is a great series to, to, to do. You know, what are the gifts, and, and how do we know what our gifts are? You know, if you are asking those questions, then you might want to talk to Pastor Lauren and see if you can't talk him into doing a series on that. Amen? So, everybody has been given a gift in the body of Christ. Uh, and while we won't be talking about the specifics of those gifts and offices this morning, it's important to understand that we all have one. And as a result of that gift, that means we all are critically important to the functioning of the body of Christ. 
in our day, in our particular place, and at this uh, particular corner of the world. Christianity was never meant to be a spectator sport. If your Christianity does not extend beyond your time in church on Sunday morning, there's a problem with your belief system. Christianity is not a spectator sport. God has called us. He has saved us. He's filled us with His Spirit. He's equipped us with gifts in order to function and, and to uh, reinforce the, the work of the, the Spirit through the body of God. Christ. There is way more ministry. Listen, I want to emphasize this because, you know, we come in on a Sunday morning and the temptation is to look up here, you know, what's going on up front. We see the worship team. We see the speakers. We see the people, you know, serving on a, on a Sunday morning church service. And we think, wow, that's the ministry. And this isn't the ministry. This is a part of the ministry. But in reality, there should be way more ministry happening outside of these walls than within. And the only way that ministry is going to happen is if everybody recognizes who we are in Christ Jesus, what gifts God has given us, and how those gifts are manifested out in the world where you and I live and breathe and work and have our being. Again, there should be way more ministry happening outside of these walls than within. And if we as a church ever get to a point where this is the highlight of what you know, is going on in our lives spiritually from week to week, then we're, we're I, I would suggest we're moving in the wrong direction. This is glorious. Amen. I, I, was, I was in tears this morning during worship. Hearing, I was up here in front, and I could hear the full force of everyone's voices and, and worship. And again, you know, having been here in the beginning when it was just my wife and I and one or two other people, you know, I was in tears. And it's a beautiful thing what God is doing here. But this is not it. This is not the goal. This is not, you know, the end game. There's a world out there that is living and dying without Christ Jesus. And the devil wants to rob us of this idea that we have any you know, part to really play in that. He would be perfectly content if you're content to come and sit in church on a Sunday morning and that be the extent of your relationship with him. That's good. It's important. Amen. We need to be here. We're going to talk about that later. The importance of being in church, the importance of being committed to a local body of believers. But... We cannot allow the enemy to rob us of the, the value of the gifts that he has given us and how those look out in the world around us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes it this way, or says it this way. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of services, but the same Lord there are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, that's you and I, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So again, that just reinforces, reinforces the idea that we are given spiritual gifts by the Lord through which we minister and serve and function together. And your gifts are going to look different than my gifts. And even when you've got two people who share the same gifts, they're still going to look different. Pastor Lauren, he's a gifted pastor and teacher. His ministry is, is similar in many ways, but different and unique than mine is, for example. And uh, I cannot do what you have been called to do. Nor can you I. We cannot you know, ser serve in each other's callings when we've been gifted specifically you know, for God's intended purpose. Now, of course, there's overlap in, in all of these things. But ultimately, 
I cannot do what God has called you to do, and I, you can't do what God has called me to do. And when we, but when we recognize, amen, when we recognize and operate in our individual giftings collectively as a church, then beautiful, glorious things happen. But in order for that to happen, a couple things have, have to happen first. Let's take a look at verse 7 again. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, we're going to spend time basically on this verse most of the morning because there's a lot of confusion about gifts in the, in the body of Christ. And so we need to start with the most important aspect of spiritual gifts. They are a gift that are given by God. They cannot be earned, and they cannot be taken. They can only be received from the Lord. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because you're not going to hear that everywhere in the church today, unfortunately. We read earlier that salvation comes to us through the grace of God alone. Salvation comes to us through the grace of God alone, and so do spiritual gifts. Paul said it. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. We don't get to decide what gifts we get. Now, having said that, there is... There are verses in the Bible that tell us to earnestly desire the best gifts. So there's nothing wrong with praying, asking the Lord, Lord, you know, give me a gift with, through which I might serve you and, and edify and encourage the body or uh, you know, impact the world. It's okay for us to pray and, and desire gifts, but at the end of the day, we must understand that gifts are given by God's grace alone and by God's wisdom and discernment. Whether it's gifts or offices or uh, any sort of ministry, it may be recognized by man, but it is bestowed by God. It may be recognized by man, but it, it can only be bestowed by God. It cannot be delegated. The Apostle Paul uses himself as an example of this over and over again. I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, what? Not by the will of, uh, sorry, by the, but by the will of God. You know, it's not like Peter, James, and John, you know, got together and said, hey, this guy Paul, you know, he'd make a great apostle. Let's appoint him. That's not how it works, how it worked, and it's not how it works today. The church can recognize someone who has received spiritual gifts and appoint that person, but to appoint that person who doesn't have spiritual gifts is a tragedy, and we are reaping the rewards of that reality in, in the church today. One of the biggest reasons why the church has a bad reputation in the world, I'm convinced, uh, at least, is because we have appointed unregenerated unspiritual and ungifted men to positions of power and leadership in the church. You can certainly see it looking back at church history. It's happened all too often because of different times and circumstances. We read earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read it again, but with a little broader, uh, a couple extra verses added on to it. And I'm, I'm, uh, you'll, you'll see that this is a, a kind of a shortened version of uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. For the sake of, of time, I've kind of paraphrased it. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11. Now to each one, to each person, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, knowledge. To another, faith healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He, 
the Spirit distributes them to each one just as he determines. The Spirit, not man, gives gifts by grace and according to Christ's gift. So, maybe on the surface that may sound like bad news because, you know, that means that all of our life experience prior to coming to Christ may or may not have any bearing upon our spiritual gift. But the, the opposite is equally true and wonderful, and, and that is that our, as our salvation is not dependent on our natural abilities, neither is our service. Let me say that again. As our salvation is not dependent upon our natural abilities, neither is our service. Our capacity, your capacity, my capacity to be used powerfully and mightily by God here and now is entirely contingent, not on our past natural strengths and talents and abilities, but upon God's gifting. And that's great news for every single one of us in this room. Because again, it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what, you know, whether you grew up in a messed up home or, you know, whether you're rich or poor or whatever the circumstance may be. It doesn't matter when you come into the grace of God and you come into salvation, you come into the body of Christ. And as God gifts you, he qualifies you to serve him. And that's important because oftentimes the temptation is to, to mistake our natural gifts with spiritual gifts. I had a, a, a good brother uh, who was a successful businessman. And because he was a successful businessman, he thought that naturally qualified him to be a church leader. And it was a painful process. But it became apparent that he wasn't gifted to be a church leader. He, he had a gifting in some other area, but it wasn't in the one he wanted. And it was, a, again, an awkward and somewhat challenging, painful process to come to that conclusion. But it was important for him. It was important for me. It's important for all of us. Just because we have a natural gift or talent doesn't automatically mean that God's going to sanctify that and call it a spiritual gift. Again, there may be some overlap, but they are distinctly different. A spiritual gift is not the same as a natural gift. On the other hand, again, as an encouragement, uh, I grew up in a home where I didn't have a father. My mother worked all the time. I had no, I, it, my home was very dysfunctional. And from a re rational perspective, I had no natural qualifications to be a pastor at all, to, to be a father to a church family. I had no background, no experience, no, you know, natural empowering for that whatsoever. And on top of that, I was a terrible student my whole life. I, I seriously, I mean, getting, you know, anything higher than a C was like, you know, my mom would reward me. <laughs> Just a C, that's all I'm asking for. I was a terrible student, and yet today the Lord, in, for whatever reason, has given me the gift of pastor and teacher. And you may be questioning how gifted he may be, <laughs> but uh, seriously, I'm as amazed as anybody. Truly amazed. And there's no confusion, I hope. Now, who gets the glory? Amen. Because he is the only one. He was able to take, you know, a broken, messed up individual and fill me with his spirit and give me a heart that was not my own and do crazy things. And the beautiful thing is that when the dust 
settles, when we're all standing before God in heaven, no one's going to be looking at me. Nobody's going to be looking at me. No one's going to be looking at you. They're gonna, we're all going to be looking at our Savior going, hallelujah. Glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords for his grace that he has shown to us, that he has allowed us to be a part of anything that he's doing in this world. And so Paul takes a moment to explain where these gifts come from, who paid for these gifts. And I ask you just to bear, bear with me for a minute because this is a, just a couple of quick verses we've got to push past. We're not going to dig into them very deeply before we move towards the conclusion of our message. In verse 8, Paul, having said, you know, to each one of us grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is also the one who has ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. Now here the Apostle Paul quotes from Psalm 68, verse 18. This is a Psalm of David that he wrote apparently after he had uh, taken the city of Jerusalem uh, in conquest and had established his throne. And uh, I don't know if the temple was in place there at that point or not. But basically, this psalm was originally written to give a, a kind of a spiritual behind-the-scenes view to Israel's conquest of Canaan. And it gives specific detail to this idea that God, Yahweh, uh, ascends Mount Zion, the triumphant, victorious king, and is seated there upon his throne, having vanquished his foes. And this reference to captivity uh, is referring to Israel's bondage to Israel. I'm sorry, to uh, Egypt. And the whole psalm kind of builds up, you know, that, that uh, as God is celebrating this victory, he uh, is crowned by receiving gifts. Now, Paul takes this old uh, psalm and he re gives it new identity. He, he gives it a second meaning, which we find often in the scriptures. He, he, he reattributes it to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. What it's amazing about that is clearly this psalm is talking about God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Israel, and here he reattributes it to Jesus, Son of God, which is a, another evidence to the fact that Jesus is the second, is God the second person of the Godhead, the, tr the Trinity. So Paul attributes this verse as speaking to the, uh, the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, not only making him equal with Yahweh, but going on to apply the conquest theme, applying the conquest theme to Jesus' life and ministry. He descended, speaking of his incarnation, his virgin birth, sinless life, sacrificial death, and he ascended referring to his resurrection and ascension. And then this idea of the captivity being uh, taken captive is a reference to you and I. How we were once in bondage to sin, enslaved to our old nature, and Jesus has come and made us slaves and bond slaves of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Then, from heaven, we're told as a, as a celebration of his victory, this idea of gifts being given to his people through this work of grace. Now, for those theologians that are here in the room, I understand that there's a little bit of tweaking in the, the language there. I'm going to leave that for another study, but uh, we don't have time for that this morning. But suffice it to say, the Apostle Paul uh, ad adapts this Old Testament truth uh, 
and, and uh, relates it to the victorious ministry and sacrifice of Christ Jesus our Lord. And as a result of his triumph, he showers his people with gifts. But this time it's in the form of <coughs> spiritual gifts. Now, let's press forward, verses 11 through 13. We're almost there, guys, believe it or not. Verse 11. Uh, I want to go back to verse 7, and then I'm going to come to verse 11. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And he, God, gave himself, sorry, forgive me, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so here Paul says, God has given gifts in the form of people, men and women, given to the church to lead it. Time, again, does not allow us to look at these individually. We'll probably get a little more into it next week. But suffice it to say that Jesus gave gifted leadership to the church. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, this term saint is depending on your background, is going to mean different things to different people. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. For many of us, when you hear the word saint, you think of an elite class of godly people that are way above us peons, you know, us normal, average Christians. Uh, we think of iconized people who have lived exceptionally pious lives and have been elected or voted into sainthood by the church. This is very common in different aspects of Christianity. We kind of look at saints as untouchables, you know, uh, that are so holy uh, that veneration, worship is given to them. Now, these people that have been sainted, if you will, in some corners of Christianity, may have been exceptional people, and they may, their lives may have served as an example, but they were never intended to be adored or worshipped. It's idolatry, the worship of saints. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, one, Jesus Christ. The, he's the only one you need to get to God. You don't need St. John or St. Joseph or George or Alex or anybody else. You need Jesus to get to God. The biblical definition of saints is a believer. That's the word saint in the Greek, agios, agion, ag agia. I don't know, forgive me if I'm tearing that up. Uh, means to be consecrated, set apart. Uh, it means to uh, be sacred. And saints are consecrated by the blood of Jesus Christ. You read your Bible, it's unmistakable. Everywhere we find the word saint, it's just where the scriptures are talking to the average believer. You and I, if we're under the blood of Christ, if we're born again Christians, you and I are saints. We are the saints of God from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And the very moment we become born again, we become a saint of God. And so, now he brings us back to our verse, God has given gifted men and women for the building, I'm sorry, uh, for equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So guess what, guys? That means the job's ours 
The work belongs to you and I. It's not for some, you know, super elite group of Christians. It's for you and I. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Gifted to go out and do the work of the ministry. You and I, uh, God has given gifts of, of, of a gifted leadership to equip and to edify the body of Christ. Leaders are given for the purpose of instructing, exemplifying, important, can't forget that, and enabling the believers, the saints, to do the work of the ministry. And the work of the ministry is whatever it may look like at any given time, in any given place, at any given moment. It brings us back to this concept of Christianity is not a spectator sport. We don't come in and, you know, cheer on the Christian leaders and then go away and, and live indifferently. The ministry is not Sunday morning services. Jesus said, go into all the nations. Make disciples of all the nations. Jesus said, bear witness of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. What does that mean for you? What does it mean for me? It's not going to happen here on a Sunday morning. This is, for, this is when you and I gather together as family, and hopefully, God willing, you're being encouraged, as it says here. You're being edified. You're being equipped so what? We can go out and do the work of the ministry. Our, our, our marriages, our families, the places we work and study, the places where we shop, play sports, everywhere we go, it is the mission field. And so we are given these gifts. Why? Now listen, this brings us full circle, guys. We're coming to an end. See some... You guys are awesome. We can do this. This brings us full circle. He gave some to be gifted leaders for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What? Till all come to the unity of the faith. So he brings it all the way back to the opening parts of the chapter where he says endeavor to keep the unity. Endeavor to be humble, to be gentle, to be forgiving and forbearing with one another. Gifts have been given to us individually so that we can build and establish and solidify the unity of the faith and the body of Christ. The diversity and differences that we each have when they are lined up together for the sole purpose of making the church function as a whole, and amazing things have, can, and will happen. And that's why, and that's why it's so important to be committed to a church body of believers where you are being fed the Word of God, where you are being encouraged in Christian life and doctrine and practice. Last verse for the day. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, we get this warning. Let us consider one another. That means the person sitting next to you. In order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling together of the brethren. The assembling of ourselves together. As is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. It's important to be a part of a fellowship of believers. It's important because this is where this whole dynamic takes place. Our, our different giftings are in operation together collectively and we can do what God has called us to do to be a light and a witness to the city we live in, to the people 
we love and know. And the exhortation is all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen? And boy, I don't even know how to comment on that. Do you see the day approaching? The crazy times. And that brings us to the communion table. Amen? Amen. Paul said, whenever you drink the bread and uh, eat, sorry, did I just say that? Eat the bread and drink the cup. I think that's a first. Whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, thank you, until he comes. I know it. <laughs> it's all right. The brain's starting to... Um, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we gather this morning, as we pass out this bread, these pieces of bread and these cups, which represent the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, which, which speak of the price that God paid for our salvation, as we take these things, you know, we're called to examine ourselves, to judge ourselves that we be not be judged. If you're not a committed follower of Christ, then I'm, I would suggest you just let this pass. Don't feel any pressure. Don't feel awkward. Uh, if you haven't, you know, if you're just not ready to make that commitment to Christ yet, then, then don't take the bread in the cup. It's not going to do you any good. If anything, you know, taking it without believing, it'll just deaden your conviction. Now, if you're here this morning and you haven't made a commitment to Christ, but you want to, then that's a whole other story. Amen? Right here and right now, you can cry out to God for forgiveness. You can cry. If you've, if you've been come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and you know that you're a sinner that needs a Savior, you can cry out to God right here, right now, in the, in the quietness of your heart, and say, God, I, I need you. I, I, I'm dead in my sins, but I believe you sent your son Jesus I believe he died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. If you can say that in your heart, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. But that, in, you know, I want to make it too easy. It means turning away from your old life. <coughs> Repentance. For the rest of us, this morning, this is a time where we stop as we're passing out, as the worship team comes up and leads us in a song and the elements are being passed out, it's time for us to say, Lord, you're coming. I know you're coming. Am I using the gifts you gave me? Do I even know what they are? You know, am, I, am I fulfilling my part in the, in the body of Christ and the work that you've called us to do? I need grace. Give me grace. More grace, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the work of your spirit. Thank you for your word, and thank you for the...